it's good to be here again. Uh, I was here maybe a year and a half ago, uh, getting to be with you guys, and and also you, uh, Brandon Reddick, uh, your pastor. He preached at our church. Um, I think the week or two weeks before this church launched, and so we have been partnered together. We laid hands on him, uh, and you know about twenty of you guys came and and just prayed for you as you guys launched as a church. Uh, I just want to know I love you guys, and I'm just so honored to be here. I really am. Um, so, what I do is, is my name is Jonathan Gordon. I'm a pastor at City Life. My primary responsibility is I pastor about 200 homeless. And so uh, I was a pastor of First Baptist Church, and uh, for about 25 years, First Baptist has been had a ministry of the homeless. And so it's a long history. And so I've gotten to kind of take that legacy and, and really pastor. And so I spend a lot of time uh, just on the streets and just hanging out with people, knowing their story. And it's, it's my joy uh, to get to do that. It is a gift. Um, and uh, so it's, it's just wonderful, and I love it all the time, and I'm thankful to be here. Well, let's, let's dive in. Um, we're going to be out of Philippians 2. So Philippians 2, 1 through 11. If you'll read it with me. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete, that's a command, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was, not, who was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Let me pray. God, we come to you. This is a text that many of us know. We've heard it before. Lord, but would you use this text to transform us? Would you use this text to let us see who you are? May our eyes gaze on you. May we stop looking at the world around us and everything that's involved in our own life. May we see who you are. And in response, may we change. May we worship you with everything we do. May we look after the interests of others and not just the interests of ourselves, our own family, our own ethnic group, our own social class, our own country. But would we look at the interests of others? May we have your mind, Christ. May we love because you loved us. Help us today. This is not easy, God. But God, would you change us today? Would your word, would we chew on it? Would we feed from it? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, on our computers, we constantly are being berated by malware. Malware is something that hackers, but also companies, use to attach to code in your computer, and it stays and hides, 
And then it gives information about what you do. And so it reports information back to these advertising companies and says what you like to click on. Have you ever noticed in your Instagram, you're kind of going and then all of a sudden you see, man, I just looked at that book on Amazon and I didn't buy it. See, they have, these companies, our world is pursuing us. It's wanting to know what you do all the time, but it's wanting to know so it can manipulate you, so it can create you to buy certain kind of things, so it knows how to bring advertisements at you in a way that will entice you. See, we are in a world where we are pursued all the time. We're constantly being pursued. And many times we don't know it. And with God, pursuit looks in different ways. I've had two times in my life where, in, in my recent life, where like God has just clearly been moving and kind of told me the future. The first one was in 2011. I had a job offer from a seminary professor. It was going to be a long-term job. I mean, it was one of, it was like the job you wanted. A year in advance, I, I was going to, about to sign a contract. I was about to sign this contract. And the day before I signed, a scandal came out, and this professor quit. Before they could get fired, police got involved, and it was a mess. I have very close friends that were really, really hurt. We had to call the state board. It was horrible. And so I am, okay, I don't have a job now. And, and I really, it didn't really bother me that much, but it was kind of like, well, what do I do now? And I just kind of waited a few months, and then all of a sudden I, I got a phone call from a, pat, from a church here in Wichita, Kansas. So my dad was the senior pastor of First Baptist Church for 12 years when I was a kid. And so right before, right after that, I moved to California right before high school. And California is where I would say is my home. It's what's formed me. I then went to UCLA. It's, a, it's the most diverse school in the world. That formed and shaped who I am. My high school had more Asians than it did white people. I was surrounded in a multicultural context. And then when I was in Chicago in seminary, I was a pastor for four years in an African-American church in the inner city of Chicago. And so here all of a sudden, a white pastor, a white church is calling me about maybe wanting me to come. And they kind of went through my dad, and my dad was like, he would never go. He's, he hates small cities. He wants to be in L.A., Chicago, Atlanta, New York. That, that's still today where I want to be. But on this phone call, see, what I didn't fully know is that First Baptist in downtown Wichita had a Hispanic, Arabic, Chinese, Lao Thai, homeless, and English service. Six churches in one. And in this conversation, the Holy Spirit told me, John, this is it. Don't look anywhere else. This is where you're going. I didn't talk to a single other church. I waited three months until a church called me to even start the interview process. I just knew I'm going back to Wichita, and I don't want to. I love this city. It's been great to me, but I want to be in the urban core of a big city. I want to be in L.A. where I'm from. But no. So I was called here. And man, it's just been such a blessing to come back and be a part of a place where I spent as a little kid. Well then, and, and if you're doing social media, can you stop? I'm going to be honest real quick. Uh, I was struggling at First Baptist. I was struggling. It was another multicultural context. It was a white context, a white service. It was old school. And, and I, I was in charge of kind of bringing this young vitality back. And we didn't have, my wife and I didn't have friends. It was hard. And it was, it was becoming a place where, okay, I don't know how much longer we could stay. My wife and I. And then I get this call 
from a guy named Joey Fink. He's the number two guy at City Life Church. He calls me and he says, hey, I heard you guys would maybe want to partner. I was like, what are you talking about? I don't want to partner with anybody. Like, I don't, like, we have enough ministry. We have a dental clinic, medical clinic, haircut. I mean, we have so much stuff going in, in this church. We don't need to add other things. We need to say no and start cutting stuff down. I said, what are you talking about? I was that direct on the phone call. I'd never met this guy in my life. He goes, well, would you guys, it was actually Brandon Reddick that passed on the information from jo- to Josh to one of our pastors. They kind of heard me some, speak some things and that maybe we would be interested in a merge, First Baptist. And I said, you're not going to freaking believe this. My senior pastor and I just four days ago talked about maybe doing something with City Life. And so four, three, two days later, so that was November 1st, two days later, my wife and, no, sorry, two days later, Casey, the senior pastor of City Life, Joey, myself, and Steve, we get together and we spend four hours with one another. We are crying, and I go home that night and I tell my wife, the Holy Spirit told me we're merging with City Life Church. We're merging. Two churches are going to marry one another, and we're going to become one. And so all of a sudden, my wife and I were at a place where we were struggling, and now we see God's vitality in it. And see, it, it was fun. It was great. It was exciting. And through the, it took us like nine months to figure this out, pray through it. Everyone else was stressed. I mean, Casey, Joey, they were like, man, I don't know if this is going to work. And I was like, trust me, it's going to. I'm the only one on both sides that did not have a freak out. And man, I loved it. It was great to be that stable thing. And, and, and if, if we're, that's kind of what we want with this Jesus. We want him, we want God to clearly communicate all the time, man, this is where you're going, this is what I'm doing, this is what's up. And see, if you talk to atheists, that's what they'll say, or people who are struggling in their faith, like, I don't know if I want to believe in this Jesus, will say, where is God? Where is he? I see all this evil. How could he be good if this evil's here? Atheists, will, I do debates with the atheist group here at Wichita State. They'll talk about divine hiddenness. If God's here, I'm saying, God, come. If he loves me, why wouldn't he show up? Why isn't God here? If you talk to people in suffering, Christian, non-Christian, they'll start to say, why is this happening to me? I don't understand why would God give this to me? They'll start to question, can I see God more clearly? Where is God? And see, what I want to talk about and what I think this text deals with is this, how can we be confident that God is pursuing us? How can we be confident that God is speaking to us? This text gives us that. It gives us this confidence if you, look at, if you look at verse 27 in your Bible of chapter 1, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So in everything you do, it needs to be worthy of the gospel. In everything. In everything. And then look at verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. See, this is a prison letter. Paul is in prison, yo. He is in prison. He is locked up. He's suffering. He's saying, hey, you guys are in suffering. We're both in it. And here's You preached the mic out. (laughs) It's okay. Yeah. (laughs) It's always fun to break a mic, I guess, right? You guys could still probably still hear me a little bit, right? I don't even need a mic! (laughs) 
So if, if, you, how, how close do I need to hold it? <laughs> uh, okay, me do me. Yeah, I will. Okay. <laughs> See, I, I spent time in African American church and it starts coming out and I, I can't control it and it, I sometimes can be offensive, like, why is that white boy acting like that? It's, it just happens. I don't intend to do it. It just does it. And so take it as I've been in the black church, and I'm still extra white. Uh, <laughs> um, if you have any encouragement, if you have any love, then complete my joy. Act like this. So if, see, first, we need to focus on the love of God. If you've had, if you've experienced the love of God, then you should do these things. But you first need to have the love of God. See, some of you, some of you only focus on what you need to do on who you need to be, and you don't. Your mind does not dwell on, your mind does not think about how you are loved. If in, if in a passage, when you read a passage on your, by yourself, and if what the first thing that comes to you is conviction, man, I need to do this, you need to have a time, you need to go to Brandon or a pastor here and say, this is always what happens. And when congregants come to me that way, I say, you are, for a month, you are to ignore that, that, you are to ignore that feeling. I want you to feel zero conviction for a month. Feel zero conviction, and every time you read a passage, only feel and think about the love of God. You obviously feel this conviction all the time. I now need you to work the muscle of feeling the love of God, of thinking about the love of God. See, this is moralistic Christianity creeping up. This is, what you, this is who you need to look like. This is what you need to do. And so if in your quiet time, if in your worship, if you're not thinking about, man, I love God. I love being with him. He loves me. Then you need to start spending more time in this camp. See, look, I, I want to take us through, like, this text, you see this pattern again. Verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So have the mind of Christ. Have the mind of Christ. Well, how do you know how to have the mind of Christ unless you know who Christ is? And so then it goes, verse 6. Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped. See, it says we, we need to act like God. We need to act like Jesus, but then it's saying, well, here's who Jesus is. Here's what Jesus did for you. You need to know this first. And see, this, you see, I'll put that back up. With God, a thing to be grasped. That's a whole, grasped is a horrible translation. That's not what the Greek word means. In, in, when, when you get to English, because it, it, it kind of gives this view that you're hanging off a cliff and you're barely holding on. I, I've got a grasp, but, but man, this could slip. I'm, I'm just going to let it slip. No, that's not what that means. What it means is God had it. He had full grip. He, was, he did not hang on. He, he had it. He, he was God, and he chose to let go. He chose not to stay in heaven. He chose to become a man for you. He chose to be in a place where he is with the Father and the Holy Spirit in their perfect unity, perfect love, to come down here, become a refugee. Jesus was a refugee. He had to flee. He came to be poor, born in a, born in a manger, out in a straw. Isaiah talks about that he didn't look good. Like, like, he did not come to this power of this posh life, and then he was killed. So we have this God who's given up his power, has given up his position. Verse 7. 
but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He became a man. I don't know about you, but I get depressed at times. I feel a lot of things. I get angry. My life, and like, I have a very privileged life. My dad has a PhD. Like my, I, I was born into privilege. But man, like, my feelings are everywhere. It's a challenge. I mean, you can just look at my weight and say, man, there's some things he's struggling with for sure. Like, I wear that I sin. I can't hide this. That's the beauty of being fat. Is <laughs> that, like, it, it, like, gives me, like, well, I know everyone knows it, so I might as well talk about it. I mean, it's true. And let me tell you, that gives me so much credence with the homeless. Because the homeless know. People talk about. People talk about, man, we got to love the poor, but they don't want to be with them. They don't want to hang out with them. They don't want to be friends with them. You know what that does to the dignity of somebody? That no one wants to look you in the eye? I do that to them too. I do not love them well so often. But when I talk about being fat, and I do it very, very regularly in the service, I'll tell you, it, it, it draws them. They know that I empathize, that I do not come in and try to play a power game. I come in and say, yo, I know that like, you may think that because I'm a pastor, because I have, I have a house, that I have it together, I don't. I don't, it's a mask. I need the grace of Jesus just like you do. And that's why the church, like J Jesus knows our stuff. He's been human. He knows the temptations, this verse. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the human likeness of men. He knows. He gets it. Jesus was sexually abused. You know that. He was sexually abused. Jesus was murdered. Jesus was cussed at. He was so physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. I, I preached this, and I had a lot of people come up. What do you mean Jesus was sexually abused? His clothes were ripped from him in public, and he was put up on a cross naked, and people mocked him. That's sexual assault. Clearly, no question. That is, by definition, sexual abuse. So if, if the worst thing that's ever, that can happen, sexual abuse probably is it. Jesus has experienced it. Jesus did not get bitter from it. Jesus could have gotten mad and hated them, but he chose on the cross, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So when, if, if you've had racism, if you've had this stuff come at you, Jesus gets it. If people from class, he had people talked about being uneducated, being poor, being a carpenter. He gets it. That's why I'm so, so frustrated at all Republicans and all Democrats. I want to punch them all in the face. <laughs> and I want to punch a lot of racial justice people, like the Democrats. I don't mean to hate on them right now. And I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, so, but they talk about social justice, which is my area. And I said, well, where do you live? What kind of car do you drive? Do you live it? And if you don't, shut up. I apologize if shut up's offensive to you. I don't mean to be offensive. But see, that's, that's the life that the Christian gives. Is this, we have a Jesus who has had all of this happen to him. And he shows us the way of how to actually enter this, how to forgive. That's why we're a, a Christian, it's a Christian before you're a Republican, it's a Christian before you're a Democrat, because it's going to demand that you don't act like a Democrat or demand that you don't act like a Republican.
See, what I know is, is that, yes, he prayed for Donald Trump today. I've also been here where he prayed for President Obama. That's when I know a church is really trying to engage politics when they don't allow that to decide who they pray for. So Jesus became a man and understands what we're going through. See, that is pursuit. He's pursued you. He pursued to understand every little thing that happens to you. Every temptation he has felt, Hebrews 4. That's the kind of pursuing God that we have. A God who pursues, and pursues by giving his own life. Pursues, who actually takes on the consequence of forgiving. Do you know forgiving costs you something? It hurts. It hurts. And Jesus did that. That was a rant I did not intend to go on. I do not do this at City Life. <laughs> Um, verse 8 and being found in the human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross see I get kind of proud of myself if I'm honest Uh, because you know I I live in a semi hood like you know it was kind of a stepping stone for my wife like she wasn't ready to go to Ninth and Grove where I wanted to go and so we went to Second and Grove. But my house was robbed this week. And it's been robbed before. And I just don't care. I don't care. Take the only thing I have that's valuable is my kids, my wife, and an Apple computer. <laughs> that's it. That's all we have. I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. I don't make money. But... My wife and I have had to, we've chosen that every time we go on vacation, we know people might steal this stuff. And we've had to just say, like, there is nothing, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in white suburb, I I grew up in Orange County, California. Most of my friends are millionaires. I grew up around a lot of money. And let me tell you, my heart needs to live where I live. I need it. Because I will grasp on to things I will grasp and hold on to it. But when I live where I live, I know that my house might get robbed. And I just have to say, okay, every time I go on vacation, I know this this all might be gone. And and so I process through it. So when it actually happens, whatever. And my wife's in the same place. And it's because of Jesus, what he's done for me. It's that I've actually put myself in the shoes of people who live in the hood and say, I don't want them to do that alone. I want to choose to give up my suburban privilege. I want to give up my male privilege in order to be among the people and say, yeah, my house got robbed too. Yeah, I'm concerned about our public schools too of sending my child there too. Like, it's not their problem anymore, it's our problem. And so I, I, I've taken the incarnational model. It's, it's because of what Jesus has done. Because he became a man, this is, this, I've oriented my life around this. This is why I live where I live. Two nights ago, we talked about maybe moving down to downtown to live where the homeless live. Because my job just changed six months ago that now that's my full-time time. That's all I put my time to mostly. And so now it's like, okay, like, I think I need to move to be incarnational to the homeless. What does that look like? How do I do that? How can I start to say these are our problems rather than just their problems? I want to empathize, and that's what Christ did. He empathizes with us. He knows every temptation. He knows every struggle we have. And then verse 8, he actually takes it to a level that not one single person in this room has taken it because we're all here. He died. He actually died for them. He died for us. He gave it all. He gave it all. He gave it all. And see, 
This is, this is who God is from the very beginning. If we go to Genesis, go to Genesis 3.8. And they heard the sound, okay, this is, this is after Adam and Eve. They've fallen, they've eaten. You know, they're in paradise and they've eaten the apple, the fruit. They've eaten the fruit of the forbidden tree. And then here, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Humanity sinned. God still pursued. Keep the verse up, please. God still pursued. God still walked in the garden. God knew what they had done. He knows everything, and he still pursued them, walked among them, walked towards them when they're in their sin. Because even when you hide, next verse, verse 9, so they hide, but the Lord God called the man and said to him, where are you? So even when humanity hides, that shame, when we feel like we're not worthy, when we feel like we cannot be in the presence of anyone, we can't let anyone see what's going on in our life. We can't let anyone see this sin. God pursued them, but the Lord called out, spoke to them, where are you? Just showing his love. This is who God has been from the very, very beginning, is a God of love. This is how he created us to be, to be people who are loved on. Verse 10. And then he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. That's that's how they respond. I, I, I was hiding I knew I couldn't be in your presence. I was in shame. And then go to 21. Or is there verse 11 or is the next one 20? No, okay. Verse 21 says that God then provided garments for them because they were ashamed to be naked. So now that they were in their shame, God provided clothing. God provided them so they would not feel shame everywhere and anywhere they went. See, God... This God loves and pursues you in all of your situations. He loves and pursues you. But if we're honest, if we're honest, what we, what we, we start to feel is this. Verse 5, chapter 2 of Philippians. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Jesus Christ. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ? We're supposed to think, feel, act like Christ? Like, it is so easy for us to just jump over what that means. And we say, this God is all-knowing, all-powerful, created everything outside of time, and we just want to say, like, being like him is easy? I can't even get the job I want. I can't get to the right city. I can't control stuff. I wanted a girl, and I got a boy. I don't have power. But God can do all that just like this. And I'm supposed to be like him? I'm supposed to have his mind? I'm supposed to love like he loved? Are you joking me? Do you know how hard this is? Do you know how impossible this is? And how offensive this is? There is no chance I'm going to do that. I can't make it one hour. You can't make it one hour. And the truth is, is you feel this burden. And when you come into church and act like everything's all right, you're standing up in your own righteousness. When you say, like, man, like, God is good, like, there's never a day where you should not also talk about a struggle. There's never a time where you should be in a community group where you don't talk about something that's not going right. 
Because if, if you don't talk about it, that means you're not thinking about it. It means you're not aware of what's going on in your life. Give me, as a pastor, two minutes with anybody, and I'll point, there's what's something going on in your life. We, we feel, we feel this, that, man, we cannot carry this. We cannot do this. This burden is too tough. But look at what the text says. Look at this burden. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What if Republicans and Democrats started looking at the other person's interests? I know. Have you ever, in this whole year and a half of craziness, ever seen the other side start looking after the interests of the other side? I haven't. Like, it is impossible to be a Christian politician and not look after the interests of the other side. It's impossible. We are to look after interests. So if I only look after white males, I will benefit. I will. Because I'm white and I'm a male. I will. And so I had a seminary professor who was, his name was Peter Cha. He grew up in Korea. He, he moved in, from in, when he was 11 years old to Compton, California, in the hood. Got an understanding of what the hood's like, then moved to a white suburb Philadelphia. It changed and formed him that different communities have different needs. And so when he, he became a professor, and now... And, and I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and there's a large Chinese and Asian international uh, program there. And all of the Asian students, and this is from his mouth, said, finally, we got someone to represent us. Finally. We finally got an Asian guy to care for our needs. And Dr. Cha felt that pressure. Dr. Cha felt that pressure. He felt that that just that manipulation, and what he said is, is that I'm going to protect the African Americans, the Hispanics, and the women at the seminary. I'm going to look after the interests of other people. I'm going to make sure I do that. And that's what he did. And that's what he taught me. And so he ta- I saw his life, and it came out of this scripture, looking at the interests of others. But this is hard and it's challenging. We all like to be in our own culture. I don't care if you're African American, you like to be in an African American context. If you're white, you prefer to be in a white context. There's some sexiness for a while, I get it. It took me, I was at the African American church for four years. The first year, I thought the African American church did everything right. Like man, they know how to do church, everything they do is right. And then all of a sudden I got to a place where Man, they don't do anything right. Like, they have a choir, and all they do is sing at me. I need a guitar. And it took me a year. It took me a year of going to the service and saying, I don't want to be here. I don't want to worship. And it took me working at saying, no, I don't need a certain kind of music to worship. I just need to worship my God. I just need to worship. And so it took me a year and a half a year to get over that and then to come back towards a middle place for the last two years of ministry there of saying, man, this African American church really gets some things right. They know how to grieve, they know how to express themselves, they know how to do a lot of other things correct, they know how to speak up against injustice that the white church just doesn't understand. But then there's some things that they don't do well that the white church can really help them on. And it became of, of seeing it accurately. And not that I actually did see it accurately and was precise in all my judgments, but just of saying that neither culture is completely right or completely wrong. And it took the same thing when I came to First Baptist. It took the same thing. I went to, it's a, 
60 people, 60% of the congregation is over 65. So let's just say they did worship in a way that is not conducive to me. (laughs) And it took from right away. It, It wasn't kind of this, like, grace period. It was right away. I do not like this. It took me a year and a half to get to a place where I stopped saying, man, I, I need my culture and just saying, no, I, I'll worship here every, su- every Sunday, no matter what. So we are called, we are called to look after the interests of others. And this is unbelievably challenging. And we need to pursue it. We need to go after it. How long have I been preaching? I've been preaching 45? Oh, wow. I got to start landing this plane. I have another 45. No joke. I'm not kidding. I'm sorry. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to... Cool. Okay. Wow. Okay, so... (sighs) In this passage... What we see is, is actually the answer. We have the confidence of God's pursuit. And it's because of who God is. It's because of who God is. Look at two, chapter, chapter 2, verse 11. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue. See, like Paul is sneaking something in right here. He's sneaking something in. What he's sneaking in is this is a quote from Isaiah 45, 22 and 23. But what he's quoting is actually the Septuagint, which is the Greek New Testament. It would have been translated into Greek. And so in Isaiah 45, it said, for God is one. And in Hebrew, that's one word, it's Yahweh, But in the Septuagint, it is kairos, it is Lord. And so what he's saying is, is is that the Old Testament view that there's one God, that Jesus is that one God. It's a very subtle thing, but this would have punched Jews in the face. They were radical monotheists. They w- this is why, a main reason why Jesus got killed. You cannot claim that there's multiple gods. And right here, Jesus, Paul is like, just like, like going around quickly and saying, boom, Jesus is God. And see, oftentimes we have these illustrations of a trinity, of kind of like maybe like water, like vapor, solid, and the other form. (laughs) Or an egg, like the eggshell, the egg white, and the yolk. And what, what we do is we spend time thinking about how to clarify this mystery. And then we kind of just just ignore the trinity. We don't understand the beautiful like dynamics of the Trinity. And see, what you see is is that in verse 11, Jesus died to give the glory of God the Father. He died to give God the glory. See, I want to give God the glory. That's everything I do is to give God the glory. And then go to verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus. See, Jesus, the Father is exalting and lifting up Jesus, and then Jesus is giving glory to the Father. See, the Trinity is forever loving one another, pouring itself out. Theologians call the Trinity like the Father, like a fountain. It's always pouring out. That's why you're created. God did not need you. God did not create us so he can have these humans around to kind of play with. He created us to love. God is love. The only way this makes any kind of sense is the Trinity. The eternal eternity that forever God has been loving and pouring himself out. Because if if, the, if Jesus is not eternal, 
That means he had to create to love Jesus. So that doesn't mean God is love, because he, he, before Jesus, he wouldn't have been able to love anything. So Jesus must be eternal because God is love, and he's always been loving. He didn't create to love. And so the reason why he created us is to love us. See, this is, this is where we need to stand, that the fact that we even exist is to be loved. This is where you need to stand each and every Sunday, is that you are made to be loved on. That's why this passage, so that if you have any encouragement, if any love, if you don't have that, you can't go on to Jesus' commands because you don't get who God is, that God is love. He's love. My son, I have a three-year-old son, when he was young, he said, um, he'd cried, infants, all they do is, wah, wah. It's really annoying, and my family's very loud. I don't know if you could tell. We have gifted vocal cords. <laughs> and, and so we have a two-story house. I'd be, at the, I'd be at the corner of the house, and he'd be upstairs napping, and all of a sudden I'd hear someone crying, or I'd hear him crying. And then he wouldn't know I was coming until he saw me in the room, right? And so I started reciprocating. I started using the way he was communicating to me. I started yelling at the top of my voice. Hello, hello, Keller, I love you, I'm coming, daddy's coming, daddy loves you, hello, hello. I mean, I was just like a, a parrot, so annoying. But my son was using his voice to communicate to me, and so I wanted him to use his ears and hear me communicate to him. It was this one Sunday morning, I was in my bed, I remember this so vividly. And for the first time, I hear my son say, hello. And I said back to him, hello. He said back, hello. I said back, hello. Just a lot of that. <laughs> See, this is actually how all humans learn how to speak. This is called answering speech. Our loved ones speak to us, and then we answer back with the same words back to them. That's how humans learn language. That's how humans tell everything and communicate. And see, this is how God has made us that God is speaking to us. God created us. In order for us to be able to say anything, to communicate anything, we must answer back the same thing to him. We've got to, he shows us who he is, and we are always in response to his love. He first pursued us. He first created us out of love. Jesus came here on earth out of love. He died out of love. And everything we do is love back. Our, our, our life is love, but it's in a response to who Jesus is. There is one, one negative emotion in the perfect garden. We're always told that the garden was perfect. But there's one negative emotion. Adam was lonely. He was lonely. In order for Adam to be complete in the garden, he needed relationship. He needed to be poured on. So God created us to be poured on by brothers and sisters. That's why unity in this passage, looking after the interest for others, is essential if we are going to say that because of Adam and Eve's sin, that everyone sins, we also must say that their need, that's not just for married people, their need for love, their need for relationship is a part of how humans work. Adam was created to have a relationship, to have intimacy with God and intimacy with one another. This is why 
Loneliness is the deepest ache of humanity. May you, as a church, may you reach out and call people. May you reach out and pursue them. The New York Times in January came out that we are in a loneliness epidemic. If you are middle age and you are lonely, you have a 30% chance of dying in the next seven years. Loneliness, they're starting to see that loneliness kills people. We have, it's the easiest ever to call people. It's the easiest ever to reach out to people. But more people are lonely today than ever before. As a church, may you love like Christ loves you. May you pursue others because God is always pursuing you. Always. That's why he created you, to love on you. And so, and so if you, if you are praying and you feel that God is avoiding you, that he's not answering you, remember Jesus at the garden said, can you take this from me? And God said, no. Jesus on the cross said, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? And so if you feel that you've been abandoned by God, Jesus understands that too. Just because you feel it doesn't mean it's true. You have a high priest. You have Jesus who understands it. And you are created because he wants to love you. So may you, may you stand, and may you be always confident that God is loving you. I want to close on this. Eugene Peterson, in an interview, said that we treat prayer, I'm going to quote him actually, if you say God didn't answer my prayer, are you really saying I asked for something and didn't get exactly what I wanted? He then, with this dramatic pause, reframes the question. My question I have is, did you sit and wait for God to speak. Wait for God to pursue you, to hear God pursue you. Or do you believe prayer is for us to be pursued by the real God, or is prayer for us to speak to God and ask for what we want? Let's pray. Jesus, we are guilty of treating you like a, just a great teacher, like a CEO, like reading like we would Steve Jobs. How do we become better? But you are God. You are part of the Trinity. You are always loving. That's why you created us. That's why you created us, is to love us, to pour out on us. May we know your goodness. May we know who you are. May we know of your love. And may we look after and love like you loved us. May we have your mind because we are so saturated with your love. We've so experienced who you are and what you've done. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.